Hey guys, David here and welcome to another Dark Art Guitars video. In this part of the Dark Art CNC build, we are going to talk about this dust shoe here. Now, if you want to get caught up on everything else, I'll have a playlist linked down below. But today, this is the topic and uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, when I finished the CNC to the point where I was able to use it, I immediately wanted to cut a bunch of stuff on it because I kind of had a backlog of different uh, projects that were all waiting for it. So I ignored the uh, dust collection at first, but that just meant that there was a huge mess of wood chips and dust all over the workshop. There was like a visible layer of dust on every surface. And that, well, is no fun at all and also not great for my health. So dust shoe was always planned and uh, now it is finally complete as well. Now on my previous machine, I just had one that clamped to the spindle. And that worked great, uh, but with an automatic tool changer, that does not work. Because in order to change out the tools, the dust shoe needs to kind of go out the way automatically. And there are a couple different ways that you can do that. Uh, I think the most common one would be have some sort of pneumatic actuation, uh, where there's just a piston that uh, pushes it down uh, and pulls it up when you need to uh, do the tool change. That's also what is natively supported by the muscle. However, I saw a, a video like a couple of months or maybe even a year ago by Marius Hornberger uh, that designed like a CNC actuated uh, dust hood where like the main idea is that you can set its the exact height that you want to be working at and you could even uh, insert it into your code that for example if you're cutting something down every time uh, you cut off a layer the dust should also moves down to be perfect always at the perfect height. So I designed that into my design here with a little stepper motor on the side, uh, some MGM7 like super tiny linear rails that this can ride up and down on. And it works. Uh, you can see uh, it in action here. Uh, however, I'm not sure if I would necessarily do it uh, like this again. However, the overall principle is very close to something that I would like. Uh, so I'm just going to show you kind of my process of how I got here and what possible improvements there are. Now, instead of uh, the dust hood being mounted to the uh, kind of Z-axis plate, uh, that carriage that moves up and down with uh, the spindle, it is actually just mounted to the uh, X-axis carriage. Uh, so uh, if the spindle moves up and down, the dust hood stays exactly in the same place. And this uh, kind of avoids the uh, scenario where you uh, kind of push on the bristles uh, if you plunge down into a hole. Uh, that creates some back force on the spindle that kind of can mess, mess with your accuracy, plus it really tears up uh, the dust hood as well. I intentionally made my X carriage slightly wider so I'd have a little bit of space here. And uh, since this is like, there's not a lot of forces on uh, this, uh, I was able to get away with just a very small MGN7 that's uh, like used on, for example, the Voron Zero 3D printers. Uh, these linear rails are commonly used. They're dirt cheap and well, the quality of these ones I got is also crap, but it doesn't matter since I'm just using them as kind of a linear motion guide and nothing uh, precise. Then the motor here uh, is a NEMA 17 uh, stepper motor with an integrated uh, lead screw that just simplified the design as I didn't have to worry about couplers or anything like that. And these ones are also very cheap uh, on AliExpress as once again, they're used for 3D printers as well. Now in retrospect, the one I got here is actually just barely powerful enough. I thought it would be more than plenty, uh, but like with the weight of it uh, hanging on there and like if something pushes against it, uh, it can uh, get overpowered. Now I'm also not using a very fancy uh, motor driver, so maybe a better driver uh, could also uh, deal with that a bit better, but I'm just using a very, I don't even remember the model name, but it's like a very uh, kind of stupid analog, uh, uh, simple, just drive the motor 100% uh, all the time uh, kind of driver. Then to know uh, where it's kind of home position are, there is uh, just a little a mechanical limit switch uh, and actually in the second revision later, I added a secondary switch and I'll get more into why I need that later. That just handles uh, homing and the homing is integrated uh, just like all the other ones. Electrically, uh, this dust hood is uh, hooked up as a fourth axis or A axis, uh, depending on what you want to call it. And then the fifth axis, the B axis is my second uh, Y axis. Uh, so, so that you know, takes care of all the five axes I have available with the muscle. But it being just a simple A axis, I get 
controls on the screen uh, to be able to control it up and down and I can also easily uh, uh, control the axis from G-code and implement that. Then the mechanical construction is uh, some 3D printed uh, stuff here at the top, as well as the coupler for this 100mm dust collector hose. Uh, by having this kind of bigger uh, unit here, I'm able to just go with the straight 100mm instead of uh, stepping down to like a smaller one, where, which I did in uh, Killer B. This just means that I get the most airflow and uh, it's the most efficient way of doing it. And then here, uh, this just kind of has a, a screw lock connection. I first uh, iteration I made it magnetic. Uh, that didn't quite hold well enough because uh, kind of, it is pulling on it somewhat. Uh, and then here I did magnetic plus screw lock, but the screw lock worked actually really well and very reliably, so I did not need the magnets at all to hold uh, it in place. And then this one here, I also uh, printed another adapter that I can thread on, and that just allows me to more easily uh, do manual cleanup, uh, get into smaller cracks as this 100mm hose kind of is limited on where it can go and you don't want to neck down a dust collector too much because uh, as opposed to a vacuum uh, like if you make it smaller you don't get more suction uh, it just kind of will get less airflow uh, so this is kind of a nice compromise and it works quite well uh, to well, clean up everything Then the base here uh, is made out of acrylic. Uh, at first I just made some plywood uh, test pieces uh, to figure out whether the design works. And then now I have two acrylic pieces. This one is held on by magnets. Uh, this way I can take it off if I want to well, have more visibility. Now, uh, since I'm not actually changing tools here anymore, I don't have to take this off very often. So maybe I'll go with something different than magnets because they've been a bit iffy. Uh, maybe I just need stronger magnets. I also have two alignment dowels uh, that just make sure that it's in the right spot. Yeah. And that also means that uh, any sort of sideways force uh, does not pop it off uh, uh, as that is just held by the dowels. The only way to pop it off is uh, like a downward force and then it falls off fairly easily. However, there is actually another reason why this falls off so easily. And that is after machining this acrylic, which by the way worked really well. Uh, you don't want to go kind of fast with acrylic. You don't want to go too slow as then you're going to start melting it. But going fast, not too deep in terms of uh, step down, worked a treat. And I got this cut out really quickly. Now it does make a huge mess everywhere. Uh, I still have statically loaded uh, acrylic chips everywhere in my workshop, although I cleaned up thoroughly. And then after uh, cutting it, of course, the sides are quite frosted and I want them to have them crystal clear. And with acrylic, you can actually use a flame to kind of polish the sides. However, what I did not take into consideration is that this is a fairly small uh, part uh, relative to how big the sides are. So I was blow torching it like crazy. Uh, you should definitely do that in a well ventilated uh, area outside and not on a wooden workbench like I did here. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> uh, but the main issue was that, well, I didn't just flame polish the sides, also the entire thing heated up and started warping and uh, was bent all out, of, all out of place. I tried to kind of bend it back, heat it up again, but it was not able to get it perfectly flat again. So this is not perfectly aligned. Also just kind of the warping kind of twist, uh, like made it elongated in some areas. So even the X, Y position of the holes uh, where the magnets are does not line up perfectly anymore between the two pieces. And that really messed with the magnetic holding power a lot. I added some more magnets to kind of counteract that, but doing that manually, the alignment is not great either. So I'll probably end up redoing these acrylic pieces. I also did manage to crack it already because I crashed it. The, so that just adds to the uh, motivation for redoing them, but for now they work and uh, having the acrylic lets to see a little bit more. You still don't really see anything that's going on, but you can at least somewhat see the tool and whether the tool is still there or something like that. One last thing and like the mechanical overview on this side, I also attached uh, one of these uh, 
air nozzles. Uh, this one allows me to uh, have some minimal quantity coolant so I can hook up an oil line to it as well as a compressed air. And then there's, uh, this one is actually quite nice. I was very surprised how nice this one is. Uh, also from AliExpress. I had some before, they were kind of crappy. Uh, I put this one mainly because it was black, uh, but it's really high quality. The arm really stays where you put it uh, and you can very finely adjust it. It's not kind of creaking like most of them. And you have fine adjustment on the side for both air volume as well as oil volume. Now, while I have kind of wooden spoil void, I will not be using oil. Uh, that is just if I ever upgrade. Uh, for now, this is just an air blast, which was very helpful as well for the acrylic. It's just gonna blow the chips out of the way and keep stuff cool. Uh, probably won't be using it for wood, but if I do any aluminum or acrylic uh, cutting, then having an air blast is great. And this is also hooked up to the controller with a solenoid so that uh, I can turn it on and off from G-code and it's just hooked up as mist. And so if I ever want to use it uh, for a tool, I just select inside of Fusion that that tool uses mist coolant and then when it's actually cutting, it will automatically turn on and turn off again when it's done cutting. Then for the electronics, uh, for how this actually works for going up and down, uh, or like more like the logic, not the electronics. Uh, inside of Maso, of course, there is no way of setting that in the automatic tool changing logic. So instead, what I'm doing is uh, when it homes, uh, it sets the kind of machine coordinate system zero up at the top where it homes. Then uh, when I want to use it, I just kind of jog to my workpiece jog it down manually to where it's just touching, and then I set that as the work to it in that system zero. And then uh, when I want to do a tool change, uh, I have to move it up all the way, which means I can just move it up to the uh, kind of machine zero. And then after the tool change is done, I can just go back to the work on it system zero. The way that you can automatically insert that into your G code is, uh, you can modify the post processor that you're using inside of Fusion or whatever the software you're using. So I took the Maso uh, post processor and found where it has the tool changer logic. And before the tool uh, change, I just have it go to the machine zero and then it does the tool change logic. And after the tool change logic is over, I have it go back to the work on system zero. This is very reliable and make sure that it is always up when it is tool changing and this way uh, it does not collide with anything. Now there is one uh, issue with that and that is if I'm doing a manual tool change outside of a program, these commands will not be run because they are part of the G code and not part of the tool change logic. So in order to avoid any sort of mistake in that regard, I added the second limit switch and uh, that allows me to have that as the dust hood up switch uh, inside of the tool change logic as well. The reason why I can't use the homing switch is because muscle gets weird if the homing switch is triggered all the time or sometimes triggered and sometimes not, you'll get some uh, alarms that way. So having a second switch was just the easiest way to implement that. The way I have that hooked up electrically is last time I told you I needed to uh, have the dust hood up output connected to an input. Turns out it's actually not necessary to have that inside of Maso. If you just do not have the input assigned for a dust hood up signal, that part of the tool change logic will be skipped. So that's really good to know. I didn't have to do my uh, jumper wire trick. That was completely unnecessary. However, now I have the same jumper wire trick, but in line this switch. So only when this switch is pressed, uh, does my little jumper wire actually send the uh, signal to the input of the muscle. And if the switch is not pressed, uh, the tool change logic will tell the dust hood to go up. So it puts that signal high. However, that high signal never gets to the input where I read it and therefore it alarms out. That is just a nice little sa fail safe that if for whatever reason, it, I didn't move it up before I do a tool change or whatever other reason, like lost steps or something and in an automatic tool change, it didn't move up. This will also catch that and make sure I don't crunch anything up this way. So with that, I think you now have the gist of how this works, this system, and uh, it does work. It works quite well. Uh, it works reliable to the point that I've tested it so far. It's only been like half a dozen uh, different programs, so I cannot say anything long-term yet. Uh, there is, of course, a quite a large hole here in the top to be able to uh, clear all the different parts of the spindle if the spindle is all the way down. So if the machining further up, there are some open areas here and some chips can escape. 
However, they are not in the like direct line between the tool and it's flying out, so it's only if they bounce around. And not a lot of chips uh, get out this way. Some more chips will get out to the side if you're um, like machining here on the top and it's overhanging. Of course, chips can go out here on the side. That is just part of it. But uh, the main worry, uh, that, like the main chips I want to get are all the super fine ones, the dust that gets in the air and gets everywhere into my lungs. All of that is easily captured because those chips don't have a high velocity. And of the other chips, I would say 95% are also captured and taken out of the way. And in the end, uh, when the, my program is done, I can just take the hose off and uh, kind of vacuum up all of the remaining chips that landed next to the workpiece. Now, the way that I think I would do this if I did this whole thing over again is just skip the stepper motor. Uh, it's a really cool idea, but like the way I have it implemented now, I don't think I will actually ever change the height of it mid-program. Just have like the one set height that is perfect and then moving it back up. However, you could very easily implement that completely without a stepper motor. Just having like an uh, adjustable screw where you basically set an end stop uh, and then you have a pneumatic cylinder that moves it up and down. And when it moves it down, it'll just move it down up until that end stop. And you can have a little knob here that lets you adjust this end stop. And uh, that will be much simpler to implement uh, and not require any sort of electronics uh, to have it move up and down. I think that will be the easier solution and that would also fully integrate with the muscle and basically any other control. Uh, but well, I over-engineered it, but well, in so far now that it would be more work to re-engineer it and to just keep it how it is. So with that, this machine is almost entirely done. There are a couple of other small odds and ends that I still uh, need to take care of. Uh, I also had some issues with the ball screw of the Z-axis uh, kind of blowing up on itself. And that is now all replaced again. That's why this video took a bit longer to get out. Uh, I was actually done with this like almost two weeks ago. But then last week, just when I was about to film it, uh, I started noticing awful sounds coming from it. So I took it apart and had to replace uh, that ball screw. Uh, so well, then I couldn't really film it anymore. So now here we are. But after this, uh, there will, of course, still be the final video uh, where I go over everything. And uh, I should have all the other little details buttoned up by then as well. So I hope you found this video interesting, maybe gain some insights as well. And if you want to uh, get all the files, CAD files for this machine, for this dust hood and all of that, they will be available once the final video comes out. Uh, they are going to be as a, like, a purchasable model on my store. Uh, still working on like getting the file uh, nicely ironed out, but it won't be like a full on kit or, or like a step by step guide, anything like that. But it's just going to be my uh, uh, CNC, uh, like my files uh, that you can use to start designing your machine a bit earlier or well, build this exact machine if you just so desire. With that said, make sure you guys also subscribe so you don't miss that video. Also, like, comment, uh, all that good stuff, and I'll see you next time.